Every time I am shown to an old, dimly lit, and I would add, impeccably clean toilet in a Nara or Kyoto temple, I am impressed with the singular virtues of Japanese architecture. The parlor may have its charms, but the Japanese toilet truly is a place of spiritual repose. <laughs> Interesting, isn't it? Hi everyone, if you're new here, my name is Mariam. I'm an architect based in Casablanca, Morocco, and I make videos about architecture and favorite things I discover in relation to books, podcasts, videos, and so on. So, um, so far, I guess. Uh, so if you're interested, consider subscribing if you're not subscribed already. Uh, in Praise of Shadows by Junikiro Tanazaki is a book that I've seen being recommended in articles and architectural related videos. Uh, it's also been recommended uh, by, it's also been mentioned by Ando uh, himself in the book uh, Tada Ando Conversation with Students, we've discussed in previous videos that you can check here. Um, so yeah, I decided to pick it up. The book is an essay about uh, the traditional Japanese aesthetics in contrast with the Western values uh, in the modern age. And this contrast basically evolves around the element of light, which I think is what makes this book of interest to architects, in addition, of course, of having architecture as one of the main uh, subjects uh, discussed by Tanazaki, among other themes like food, cosmetics, music, etc. In this video, we'll discuss three points that I found interesting in relation to architecture. So first, toilets. Yes, I can't deny that the part about toilets is my favorite from the book. I'm a bathroom person, if that makes sense. <laughs> Meaning that one of the first things I look forward to see when I visit a place are the restrooms. Um, I like to know how it's been designed, uh, fixtures, fittings and finishings, of course if it's well ventilated, if it's been kept clean. And that is mostly in restaurants and uh, museums I visit. I already knew that there was some kind of obsession about toilets in the Japanese culture and many say that you're missing out on a lot if you haven't tried a Japanese toilet but they're talking about the, the contemporary uh, futuristic kind of you know flashes itself cleans you up kind of toilet um, well this book is written in 1933 and here Tanazaki describes the traditional Japanese toilets and he makes it sound like you're missing out on a lot again if you haven't tried one. Uh, he makes things sound so interesting to the point of making you want to use one eventually. <laughs> Apparently, uh, traditional Japanese toilets usually stand apart from the main building in the garden uh, between trees as it's described and it's considered a place where a person can meditate and be mindful of the color of the sky and the fragrance of the moth and the sound of the raindrops and the singing of the birds. Um, Tanazaki also talks about three prerequisites for, for a Japanese toilet, which are a degree of dimness, meaning it should be poorly illuminated, it should be absolutely clean, and uh, it should be super quiet. After reading this, I've personally been sold on the idea that uh, toilets don't always need to be illuminated, and it's probably the best place to play with indirect light and especially because we tend to use reflective materials in this place more than any other for functionality purposes so it's easier to clean. There's also this interesting idea of including nature in these places which adds a, a touch of luxury to them. Um, concerning those restroom visits, uh, for me one of the beautifully designed restrooms I've been to so far, I mean I've seen so far, uh, are the public ones of the Yves Saint Laurent Museum in Marrakesh. Um, Studio Crow did a great job with the whole architecture and the toilet just weren't an exception. I would describe it as soft, they've used terrazzo everywhere, on the floor, the walls, on the sink as well, so it wasn't too reflective and the shape of the curved high ceiling helped reflect the indirect light and beautifully illuminate the space enough to be used. So yeah, I have to tell the story of these images you just saw. Uh, as I was writing the script to this video, I, I thought about mentioning the restrooms at the Yves Saint Laurent Museum because, you know, they're truly beautifully designed. Uh, I've been to the museum twice so far and I remember uh, that I really liked how I felt the first time um, I was there and the second time I was like, Mom, come and have a look at their toilets. And, uh, but I forgot to take the pictures of them in the last visit and I mean, you just can't take photos of 
toilets while people are in there, you know, and be considered um, a bit creepy. Um, long story short, uh, also I couldn't find any photos of them on the internet, so I called the foundation, uh, Fondation um, uh, Jardin Majorel, and um, I was like, I would love to have pictures of your toilets. And the lady was like, that is the weirdest request I received so far. Um, uh, she was like, just send us an email and we'll see what we can do about it. Yeah, so big thanks to um, the people there for their time and for kindly sending these photos. Now let's move to the second point, gold. Uh, you can't but love how he sensibly talks about it in the book. Uh, he speaks of the gold in the lacquerware and in the robes of priests, as well as on the walls of the nobility and this, the ancient statues of uh, Buddha. Um, the idea that gold is not something to be seen in a brilliant light or to be taken in at one glance, because in this case the element decorated in gold can seem vulgar and ugly. Uh, but in case the same element were to be left in the dark and only lit with a dim light, uh, suddenly this same object becomes dignified and refined. I don't seem to agree that much with this point of view, uh, but again, personal taste. It's true that if sun rays were to directly land on a golden surface, it becomes annoying and not that comfortable to directly look at. Uh, but the reflections uh, projected on other surfaces might actually render a beautiful scene. Gold projects light in different ways, depending on the type of the light and if it's direct or indirect, if it's the sunlight or an electric light. And being able to see these changes in reflection is, I think, what makes a gold an interesting material to work with. Uh, but he specifically praises gold in the dimly lit spaces of the Japanese architecture for its capacity to draw light and become a source of illumination. And he writes, Modern man in his well-lit house knows nothing of the beauty of gold. But those who lived in the dark houses of the past were not merely captivated by its beauty. They also knew its practical value, for gold in these dim rooms must have served the function of a reflector. Their use of gold leaf and gold dust was not mere extravagance. Its reflective properties put, were put to use as a source of illumination. Silver and other metals quickly lose their gloss, but gold retains its brilliance indefinitely to light the darkness of the room. This is why gold was held in such incredibly high esteem. I loved how he drew my attention to this detail. Um, but I very much agree with and look forward to use uh, one day um, Caldwell in, in a project, maybe. Thirdly, minimalism. I guess we're all familiar with this aspect of the Japanese culture and how uh, this trend has conquered the world these last years and some even embraced it as a lifestyle. Um, again, you can't but love how he talks about it in the book. It's so poetically, it brings tears to your eyes. And, you just feel so peaceful as you read these descriptions. I like how he revealed the secret to the beauty of the Japanese rooms with their minimalist decor and how he linked it to shadows. Um, apparently Japanese rooms have this tendency to be dark. Um, he explains how the climate and the fact that they, they didn't use glass or concrete in their buildings has resulted in low roofs that are known in the Japanese architecture. And these roofs prevented sun rays from directly penetrating the rooms. Um, there is also the veranda that makes these rooms even out of reach to the direct sunlight. And so the fact that their ancestors were forced to live in dark rooms has led them to discover the beauty of shadows. He thinks that it is this indirect dim light that makes the charm of a room. They also finish uh, their walls in neutral colors, generally in clay textured with fine sand in order to keep the beauty of the soft dim light. And so they avoid any glossy finishes that would alter this pale bow uh, that they look for to create. He writes, We never tire of the sight, for to us this pale glow and these dim shadows far surpass any ornament. Uh, I liked how I was introduced uh, to this sensitive explanation of minimalism that I was so unaware of. And um, like, there are much details he talks about in relation to this point, like the design of the alcove and the, the choice of the scroll and the role of the paper in the panels. Uh, and it all makes sense to his narrative of shadows. This man's attention to details and sensory sensitivity in general 
makes you see things differently. And you can say that the book is about appreciating the little things in life. It's about the differences between the East and the West. And it's a thinking on alternatives in case the Eastern world were to conceive its own technology. And we've come to the end of this video. Um, if you liked it, please consider giving it a thumbs up. Uh, thanks a lot for watching and see you in the next one. Bye.